Good evening. Uh, I'm Patricia Camille, there might be a few faces here who don't know me. I'm president of the Archaeological Society, um, the ASM, and the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University of Malta are, as always, delighted that we've managed to start a new season. Uh, and we have almost all the uh, month booked up in the next uh, until May. Uh, so I hope we'll be seeing you at, uh, at all those events. Uh, as usual, also, the series is, um, it represents a collaboration between the Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University. Um, and thanks go, as always, to the head of the department, Dr. Carmen Ferracino, and also to uh, the, uh, Dr. Vedla, Dr. Nicholas Vedla, who is uh, also, apart from being an academic, is also that. Uh, Vice President of, of the Society. Um, the Dr. Anton Bojena will be delivering this evening's lecture, which is, as you can see, Sunjuan Baruja and two young assistants reassessing the legacy of amateur archaeology. We shall. Um, it, I've seen the presentation and it's long. So uh, we'll, we may or may not have time for. Um, for questions at, at the end. But anyway, if we do, I'm sure uh, Anton will be more than pleased to answer them. Um, just a brief uh, brief bio uh, of uh, Dr. Bujia. Yes, he's a family doctor by profession and is currently serving as a senior general practitioner at Primary Healthcare Malta. Uh, beyond this, his medical career, he has a deep passion for archaeology and is often found when archaeological activities are taking place in one form or another. With over 25 years of involvement in Walter's archaeology, Dr. Bojea has actively contributed to archaeology-related NGOs, uh, including the last 15 years or so as committee member of the Archaeological Society. He's published numerous articles and contributions in both local and international publications, focusing not only on specific archaeological sites, but also on the history of Maltese archaeology. Some of his research has adopted a biographical approach, and today he will highlight the contributions of three amateur Maltese archaeologists. His, uh, his latest publication is going to be available? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, possibly. <laughs> Um, uh, we're black, uh, fortunate um, that his uh, latest publication is going to be available um, uh, for at the end of this lecture, if anyone is uh, interested in doing that. So over to you, Anton. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tisha, for that generous introduction. As an amateur archaeologist myself, to speak about uh, Don Juan Farugia, Loreto Gravino, and uh, Publius Farugia, to speak with certain respect and look up to them because their achievements are um, noteworthy. They discovered around 17 prehistoric archaeological sites, a comparable number of uh, Roman sites. Um, they wrote together about 50 newspaper articles on this subject and took about 400 uh, photographs about Maltese um, archaeology. In this talk, um, I, I will take the approach um, to combine and to study both the contributions made to the Sunday Times of Malta by the Reverend um, Don Juan Farugia, and also uh, the photo photographic work of Loreto Gravina, currently preserved at the Nation, uh, National Museum of Archaeology. Um, one needs to combine uh, their work together. Why? Because as you see here uh, in the picture, if you have the photograph of the Safi Dolmen and you want more information on it, you can go and consult, in this case, uh, the newspaper article where you get more information. And if you want a better picture of the newspaper article, you can go to the, to the photographs uh, at, at the National Museum of Archaeology. If you look closely, uh, um, the, the same photograph is um, pro reproduced in the um, newspaper article. It's the same one. Um, I had given a similar talk on the same subject about eight years ago, and if today I'm 
delving deeper into the subject is because at one point I asked myself um, all these discoveries that they made um, and the, the places they had, had, had written on. Had anyone else written about these places before? Uh, what sources were they using? What happened to these sites? And so uh, this um, created the necessity um, to delve further into the subject. So what I'll be doing this evening is I will provide the short biographical notes on these three persons, um, then explore some of their ideas on Maltese archaeology, and then I think most of you would be interested um, about the sites, um, uh, what has happened to them, um, what were these sites that they discovered, and then maybe we have time to go into the loss of sites or sites uh, with potential and other teams. So Dujuan Farooja's life uh, coincided with the first half of the 20th century, born 1902, died in 1954. The three persons uh, were from Zaytun, and he was ordained a priest um, in, in Gozo. He lived uh, at the, I don't know if you're seeing the, the character, yes, he lived in one of the two houses here, um, close to where his aunts have lived, and he is buried uh, in this chapel uh, over over there, which is the Chapel of St. Tanj in Zaytun, because uh, as I have had information he didn't want to be buried with other priests. He was quite a, quite a, quite quite a person, <laughs> quite a person. Uh, he had even some ideas that, that preceded the Vatican Council to like um, not liking to say mass with his back towards the people. Um, he used because he didn't go well with the other priests uh, at Zaytun. He used to celebrate mass at uh, various chapels in the countryside, at Daul, uh, Palazzo Marnisi. And this brought him close to archaeology, close to farmers who were uh, informants um, about the archaeology that um, surrounded them. Um, he used to prefer and gather around him a number of young people, especially um, people older youth, older adolescents, like Publius Farugia and uh, Loreto Gravino uh, himself. The first documented, although he claims um, interest in archaeology in 1932, the first um, place I have found him documented um, as interested in archaeology is in 1938-39, just before the war, when he took RV Galia and um, Captain Charles Zammit to visit um, this building, which is the remains of a Punic building in the Domus Curialis of Zurin. It was known, uh, in fact, you have over there a drawing by Jean Cuel. Uh, but it was he who introduced <coughs> the site to the museum's uh, department. Probably he was, as a priest, he had contacts with the um, parish priest over there. And this site, uh, it was possible to carry out excavations over this site um, uh, after this contact. But the main contribution of Don Juan came after World War II, when in 1946, he discovered uh, a man here, a standing stone within a rubble wall, at Marsa Scala. And with the help of the museum's department, he informed the museum's department about this, and the, 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 the stone was clear, and that man here, um, standing stone, uh, came out of, um, uh, of this work. From this, you can already realize um, something um, particular about um, Don Juan and, and the other, uh, his, his, his assistant. He could see archaeology, interpret archaeology within rubble walls, within uh, not, not ob ob obvious archaeology, uh, not obvious stones, not obvious structures, but he could see um, archaeology uh, within, within rubble. And this enabled him to document um, others, uh, other sites that other people um, did not um, notice before. He continued to write uh, about um, archaeology, um, um, he wrote about megalithic remains, like uh, remains of Tachati over there on the right, uh, remains at um, Mencia, which is modern San Juan, which doesn't exist anymore. And notice the format he's using. He, he uses a photograph and then um, uh, just a few paragraphs describing the site. Today, that would be ideal for. Um, social media. 
Um, they recorded dolmens. It's not a dolmen like like Taha moved over here was um, uh, was already recorded and he he, he wrote about it, uh, but he, he he was involved in the discovery um, of the Safi dolmen, which all, which we can see uh, on the right. He wrote about, about statuary statuary uh, found in Roman sites, uh, Roman mortaria, linked to olive presses, and that um, uh, this this stone from Wardia, which was linked to um, the tradition links it to the baptism of St. Paul. He wrote about tombs, shaft and chamber tombs, the Tatlan tomb, uh, what he considered as a closing stone um, of a tomb at uh, Tahlan tomb. And to, when he ran out of sites and of discoveries, he, he, he wrote about things which, which had been written before. And there's a reason why, why he did this. Uh, for example, here he, he, he is describing uh, an unfinished catacomb at Xira uh, Tomas, but he's referring here to an inscription, a Christian inscription found in one of the tombs, and he's reproducing uh, the, the inscription from Eric Be Becker, uh, who wrote around 1913. Uh, before the war, there was some work carried out um, on the Salina catacombs, and we can see it over here, and one of his articles included at Salina catacombs. He also compared Tarshin with Stonehenge and wrote about the Roman villa, uh, Roman villa, what we call the Roman villa at Marsa. As I said before, he gathered around him um, a nice group of young people. And here we can see a few of them. Uh, Carmelo Latino was an older boy. Unfortunately, he, he passed away a few years ago, uh, but he was a very good informant uh, for me about Don Juan. Um, and I managed through him to get uh, as complete as possible the list of newspaper articles uh, on Don Juan. Walter Zara is a well-known person, his father of Trevor Zara, they told, he, he was one of the group, and he also shown, showed one site to Don Juan, but the people who were closest to him were Loreto Gravino, uh, the one uh, near Walter Zara on top, and Publius Farrugia uh, at the bottom. In a letter preserved at the National Museum of Archaeology, um, they give account, they, they were incidentally uh, Publius Farrugia and Loretta Gravino were art students, they studied together um, uh, art, they were uh, probably the last or two of the last students of Edward Caruana Dingley, um, uh, and they were left with him when uh, Frank Portelli and uh, Antoine Camilleri went abroad. To, to further their studies abroad. And one day, these two, two young persons uh, were, were given an errand to go on Don Juan and talk and fell around archaeology. And, uh, and he empowered them with this passion for archaeology. And they started what I consider the golden years of exploration, uh, which occurred around 1946 or 1948. In fact, when he writes Don Juan, when he writes uh, um, his newspaper articles on Zaytun, uh, which is quite early on, he says that this this was discovered, this site at Tarumi in Zaytun, as you go from Zaytun to Mar Marsa Scala, there's a skate and chapel uh, in the middle, there's a lane in front of it, um, it's, it's in the area, and he says that this was discovered by his uh, energetic assistant. So they were discovering the sites uh, for Don Juan. Incidentally, th this this um, newspaper article also shows the intention of Don Juan. When I have completed my whole investigation of the island, I wanted to write about the investigation, uh, the, the archaeological site uh, of the island. But that was not to be. Uh, these were the post-war years. Malta was um, being faced by economic problems. Uh, they were afraid when you read here. People were afraid that the population mark would reach 100,000, uh, which would, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so emigration um, was a solution was a solution uh, which was um, considered. And in no time, uh, Publius Farrugia, Loreto Gravino applied for their passports, and in 1948, Loreto Gravino and his family left for Australia, and. <coughs> 
they left for Australia where their where Loretta's brother older brother was already mm-hmm. living there. Um and the the family went over there um and left two do- two 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 sisters in Malta and they were the largest family reach- reaching Queen- Queensland at the time. Uh, so much so that they made headlines on the local newspapers, and that's a, that is um, the place from where I got um, that, that that very interesting uh, photograph. Um, so he left in 1948, and Loreto Gravino, um, incidentally, Publius Soruja left for America uh, in 1952, and in 1954 Loreto Gravino returned to Malta. He found he continued some explorations. He found Don Juan sick. Uh, and in fact, when he returned back to, to Australia, um, he was given the news that Don Juan had passed away. But in Malta, uh, Loreto Gravino met John Davis Evans. John Davis Evans, who was um, carrying out a survey of Maltese antiquities, um, uh, was in Malta at the time, uh, was well into um, his studies, and John Evans uh, tried to gather as much sources as he could. Uh, he, he, for example, from Dr. Baldacchino, uh, he, he learned about natural history, he got information from the librarian, and he met Gravino, and Gravino passed the information uh, that he had gathered, uh, together with Publius Farouge and with Don Juan, to John Evans. To the point that when John Evans, after describing the major megalithic sites, um, uh, like Khal Tarshin, um, Hajar Im, Im Naidra, uh, listed down the, um, the, the sites, a catalog of sites, individual sites, he acknowledges Gravino in, in, in some of the, of the places um, that he discovered. As you can see over there, uh, Gravino. So this information is passing through mainstream archaeology uh, at, at the time. John Evans continues to work, and in 1956 issues two important pub- publications. Um, one is on the sequence, um, the prehistoric culture sequence of, of the Maltese islands, and one uh, is um, on some excavations he carried out at the dolmen and his ideas about the dating and use of the dolmen. I think um, Gravino didn't agree with him, and Around 1958, two years after Evans published his publications, he started um, writing a, a series of uh, six newspaper articles on archaeology, giving uh, his, his ideas. Uh, when Evans publishes uh, his book, Malta, in 1959, um, a year later, Gravino writes about what he believed what were the Bronze Age towers, uh, saying his views. For, for those of you who are into archaeology, you'll immediately um, realize that that is the remains, or a Punic Roman remains, uh, uh, of a tower at Talwilja. But he, Gavino, interpreted, still thought, as it was um, in the beginning of the century, that it was uh, belonged to the Bronze Age. So these six newspaper articles, um, having them outdated I- ideas, some um, contact with evolving ideas on archaeology, but for me, they are important because um, there are six newspaper articles which provide what, the, the, what, what um, Gravino, Farugia, and Farugia were thinking and how, how their um, thoughts were developing. In 1968, uh, Gravino came back to Malta. He did um, further explorations. But the most noteworthy thing that he, he did is that he had his own set of photographs. He had some duplicate photographs um, belonging to Publius Farugia. So he had uh, double photographs. He took a set of these photographs, organized them in, in an album, um, methodologically numbered them um, and notated them, as you see, accompanied them by drawings of pottery and of sites and donated these two albums um, to the National Museum of Archaeology. And I think this is, uh, I wouldn't be speaking for long uh, having these albums be, being given to um, the National Museum of Archaeology. Um, the, the, I believe the, the, 
museum has a large collection uh, uh, of photography, but the fact that these are annotated and grouped in one place uh, makes them uh, quite uh, valuable. This is a photograph of one of the albums. You can see the, the numbering number over there of um, inhumation, a skeletal a burial of a skeleton. You can see the bottom left in a trench at the Tarshin temples. Now, this, this sounds strange because we, 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 we think of the Tarshin temples, burials of okay, there are burials of the Bronze Age, uh, which are basically cremation burials. But when I looked up, when I looked up um, uh, the, the, for a source of, to this photograph, I found that excavations really occurred in 1950s, 1950 exactly, uh, at, the Tarshin, at the Tarshin temples. Um, it shows that they had access to, 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 to what was going on uh, by the museum authorities. But in 1950, the point I'm, I'm trying to make with this photograph, Loreto Gravino was in Australia because he left in 1948 and came back in 1954. But Publius Farugia left for America in 1952. So this photograph, although we link, and I think Gravino put um, the, the albums together, um, at least some photographs are taken, were taken by Publius Farugia himself. Um, Gravino wanted to, to come back to Malta, but um, uh, I think he died around the late 1970s. Interest in Don Juan Farugia and Gravino's work continued. Um, uh, in 1978, Walter Zara, one of the people around Don Juan, um, uh, attempted to write uh, a history, a multi-volume history of this history of Zeitung. Uh, he kept newspaper articles um, by Don Juan. Um, a copy book, newspaper articles by Don Juan. For example, this is an example of, of it. It's a photo stud. I think at the time it's about the photo stud and Marco Zeitun area, which is uh, of interest. And I think taking and describing the subject chronologically um, helps us um, to um, really um, see the development of archaeological sites a, a long time. For example, here we have the mention of of, of, of Marsa Scala, uh, which is discovered in 1946, but then Walter Zara makes a comment that he, he saw it falling down and broken in two. So this um, gives us the possibility to follow some, what was happening at some sites. Dun Juan's articles were used also by Professor Mario Bohajar for his book uh, on the late Roman and Byzantine catacombs. Uh, here is the unfinished catacomb that um, Walter Zara showed to, um, to Dun Juan, and there is the write-up on the Tahlantun Hypogea, which is basically based on the newspaper articles on, um, um, which, which were written by, by, by Dun Juan. Uh, other people have, have written, but I think a major development came in 2004 when Daniel Chilia, uh, the photographer Daniel Chilia, was compiling together the book uh, Malta Before History where he discovered, uh, rediscovered the two albums at the National Museum of Archaeology and made good use, despite uh, availability of other photographs, uh, he made good use of some of the sites, like, um, like the three sites on, on, on my side, um, to, um, in, in his book. Um, this, if you notice, the people before him um, spoke about Dun Juan. But um, Chilia's work put in um, uh, Gravino's work uh, also uh, available. And he listed also a, a site, uh, a list of, and made a list of sites at the back of his, his volume. And notice many, many of the sites were, were, were considered uh, destroyed. We had no knowledge uh, about them. In 2007, I managed to. Um, Meet Publius Farugia, and here uh, is a photograph of, of ourselves near our in, 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 in Cave. In 2017, um, my, I had enough research to write a, little, a small article um, on, on this subject. And just two weeks ago, um, uh, a larger publication um, 
which was issued by World War II Day 2, which is basically, I'm giving snippets of it um, today. Publius Farugia is still alive. Um, he was 96 now, and in 2023, this is Love for Art, where he exhibited at the Detroit Contemporary um, and in the United States. So, now we come to the ideas of, of, of Dun Juan. What were his sources? His sources were varied. The typical historical sources, Caruana, Barbaro, uh, Gian Francisca Vera, but he makes good use of two, two, uh, two books. Um, he explains uh, and uses the um, tomb typology of Paul Francis Bellanti, which you can see in this book um, over here, but he makes book, good use of um, the history of, of villages by Emmanuel uh, Benjamin Vella, Ibi Vella. He, he, he quotes a lot from Ibi Vella and uh, he challenges his ideas, but um, Ibi Vella is a good source uh, for Don Juan. How do amateur archaeologists uh, learn their archaeologists and how do they do it? They do so, uh, they are not trained academically, but they do so by reading the books of archaeologists and copying their work. Here you have um, a drawing by Gravino of the pottery, uh, prehistoric pottery that he found. And to the, to the right, there is a uh, pottery from Margaret Murray. And you can see here, he's using the same, the same uh, typology of the drawing as archaeologists uh, do. They found their sites by having walks in the countryside or, or, or being living around the countryside. Here you can see a lane marked in red where there's the Karaj um, south of, 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 of Varsha. Uh, if you walk it, you can go in this direction towards Birzebuja, then you can go towards Tahlantun or Taloreto. And around that lane, you can see the sites, the Karaj Katekum, the Karkrats, um, uh, here Talbroli, there's a dolmen, a uh, sister, Tahlantun. So these are, by simply walking at the time, by simply walking in the countryside and just veering into, into a bit um, uh, into into the fields, they could discover archaeology. This is the richness uh, of the Maltese islands. Their methods, what methods did they use? They use a simple method. They use stones, large stones. They look for large stones and associate material. If large stones were were irregular and very large, and the pottery was decorated and prehistoric, that's a prehistoric site. If it was worked smaller and Roman pottery, and incredibly, and they even found lozenge shapes, tiles, um, 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 clay pipes, then they would say the site is, 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 is Roman. Simple, but incredibly effective. Now, as some of the drawings are, um, are unique, in, in, in the album are unique. There are no other, I have not found any other drawings um, uh, of, the, of some places um, elsewhere. We have to assess the accuracy, um, the accuracy to see what they represent. And above is a sketch of the dolmens at Tahamut um, near Baharicha, and the other one, the one below is a picture of the Tahamut dolmens as it appears on, uh, from Google Earth. And they basically are equivalent. I even say that the lines are not, are a bit slanted because of, of the way I, I, I treated the Google Earth, maybe with a better representation, they would be equivalent. But as you can um, immediately notice, the size of the dolmens are overrepresented, are overrepresented by the size in the drawing and then they actually are. They even, uh, Gravino even traced, um, for example, in this case, um, a picture from Temis Amit's work, and you can notice that even in tracing, there are some differences occurring. But generally, I think the, 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 the drawings um, are a fair represent, they are not 100% accurate, by, but they are, can be considered as a fair representation of um, the, um, material they document. Their ideas, as was held in the beginning of the 20th century, um, they thought that 
um, prehistoric sites lay on, 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 on prominent points, on prominent parts in the landscapes. And here we see some of the drawings showing prehistoric sites like uh, Taloli, uh, Tachai, and uh, Tarzat and Dawar represented um, on, 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 in, in high places. They also taught, Don Juan especially taught, that Roman buildings were often accompanied by, by tombs. Um, this does occur in some places, for example, Tanjawa here, uh, Talwilja, and other places, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's not universal. They found cartas close to prehist uh, prehistoric sites. Here we see cartas and a touch and near Borshlim Ramma, and as it was thought in the beginning of the 20th century, they thought that the cartrads belonged uh, to, uh, to prehistoric times, when today the, mo this, the discussion is basically uh, between Bronze Age, uh, dating to the Bronze Age, and more, more, more probably to the, Roman, to the Roman period. Here we have cartrads, which aren't found anymore, um, at Tarshin, close to the Tarshin temples. Uh, his article, Davini, if he claims that one of the cartas goes over the megaliths. Um, and incidentally, a megalith found near Tarshin, Talborj, uh, which shows the, the influence of uh, the Tarshin temple around. They also noted notches on the ground near buildings they thought were prehistoric, and, they, and Gavino thought that the, these notches were prehistoric. Um, but it wasn't found in, in, in context, so we have taken to the pin, pinch of salt. Another idea of, of them was that there was a development between um, dolmens, that big rough dolmens gave, gave way to smaller, uh, more refined dolmens. This is something which is today not uh, considered to be um, correct. Um, uh, um, but it's, it's a way of thinking that was present in the 20th century. They didn't, um, the stratigraphy was making, uh, taking its ground at the time um, Gravino was writing his, his newspaper articles. But the way it was done, they did it, as it was done at the beginning of, of the 20th century, was to document sites and try to uh, compare um, and bring conclusions out from, from, from what they saw. For example, this is another, um, another case where there is uh, there's this, this thinking of um, a fortified, the development of fortifications of the Bronze Age from small fortifications um, to larger fortifications to uh, more refined um, fortifications, but this is obviously not true. In fact, what we have there is a Bronze Age, Tarshin Sinitra, Site, um, probably uh, one like it, they should touch in symmetry to have a portion of the um, bronze age size in the beginning, in the pinnacle Roman building. So this doesn't make sense, but this is their thought process. They were amateurs, and we have to keep in mind that they may be over um, interpreting what they found. For example, um, Don Juan found what looks like a bull's head near Haljin. Um, this was given to John Evans, but John Evans did not uh, include it in his work. Here, there's an inscription, which Dun Juan claims an, an inscription found in the Mispa tanks. I've shown it to a professor, a friend of, uh, who wasn't impressed. So he was about it. Again, uh, a so-called Roman sand bottle found at Marsa Scala, um, near, near Termi. And this, uh, this was actually a, a joke done on Dun Juan <laughs> by Doreto Gradino. And Publius Farrugia, um, Likewise, um, they claimed that these two wells at, at, we have to be careful because, likewise, at these two wells uh, near Buleben between Zaytun and Zabbar, they, uh, they Gravino claimed that these were uh, silo pits. And, uh, and uh, Obviously, it doesn't make sense having two wells close to each other, uh, but we have to be really careful uh, about uh, dismissing their, their information because when the site was cleared, 
uh, development related uh, work, about 40 silos emerge um, in, 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 in the field. So, um, uh, so one has really uh, to be careful. Now, I'll start uh, the reassessment of the sites. I'm trying to see what happened to these sites, how many have survived, what significance that they have, the information they gave reliable, and how do, do they relate to the sources. Um, my sources are Passallo sketchbook, Zamit notebooks, and Dugolini, and Ibevel, obviously, for, for um, the period before um, Dunjuan or contemporary, uh, before Dunjuan, to see what happens to, to the sites. I also consulted Tang's notebooks, made good use of the maps of the Museum of Archaeology, and then by using toponyms on, on map, maps, doing field walking, this was done about uh, 20 years ago, and today, when, when that is more difficult, Google Earth. The sources, whatever sources came, um, I used them. So I start by the men here that uh, Dun Juan discovered at the Mars Scala. Um, the album, one of the album, gives the best documentation available on this site. Uh, you won't find anything better. It shows the pottery found on site, which is clearly, you see a tunnel handle there, um, piece of pottery which is prehistoric. The, the, the drawing and the picture of the man here and the notch at the base where the prehistoric pottery was found. And they discovered there is evidence sites and uh, discovered uh, a number of dolmens. Um, here you have the entire dolmen, which I think is destroyed. Um, within the rubble wall, the Taljarda dolmen uh, still exists. Uh, and it's, it's a modified, it's like a, like a small corbett hut, but um, this has one, a megalith on one side, one side, and the, uh, and the capstone uh, still present in situ. I am showing, I'm being generous in showing the photographs of Talbrolli dolmen uh, on the outskirts of Birzebulia, because this dolmen was, um, has been looked for uh, for the past um, search for for the past thirty years, and no one has managed to find it. And the the the, the, the pictures, the photographs in the album, are uh, the are the remaining record. You don't have a typical dolmen where you have a, um, a horizontal stone lying on on two or more supporting stones. But what is being interpreted here is that one supporting stone gave way. And you have a, 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 the capstone resting on one stone, like what occurs in the um, uh, Shara, um, the Shara, Shara dolmen, Hajrat uh, Asan Where the dolmens still exist today, there is often um, problems with accessibility. And the, the, the big photographs in the album and the sketches can help us relate with the sites in question. For example, here we have. Um, a photograph of the Bidni Dolmen and a part of the museum and a new report. And I will read the, the part of the museum and new report illustrating it with the dolmen. A typical dolmen in fairly good um, state of preservation was discovered visiting the top of a rocky plateau at Al Bidni. The space enclosed is about 92 centimeters. The slab has an average thickness of 25 centimeters. In the middle of the slab, a round hole, you can see it here, a round hole um, pierces the stone. This has weakened the slab, which is now broken into, and broken into, and the two portions of the slab are still in touch and in situ supported all around by large blocks of stone. The remains of a megalithic wall, which is double in some places, uh, itself can be seen to the south of the dormant. And that shows um, what um, these uh, what these photographs and uh, illustrations can help us do. The albums are a very good collection. Uh, I think one of the, the best collections of informations of the of, of the dolmens. They show, unlike others, um, dolmens related to nearby uh, remains, also show. More than one dolmen at particular sites, we have to remember and make us remember that dolmens do not occur in isolation. 
and they are quite useful for anyone embarking um, on a study of the subject. This is one site, a megalithic site, um, a site with megaliths, and don't want to say prehistoric pottery was found around it. Uh, this is how the site appeared earlier uh, this year, where it's overgrown, but still it hasn't been uh, untouched. In my um, when I give when I give in the book the coordinates of of of, of such places, I use uh, the same system as the um, superintendent of cultural heritage does. I go into the website of the planning authority, uh, click on it, press the search button on top, uh, go search by coordinates, use projected WGS eighty four type in the, um, uh, the coordinates, opt for an orthophoto, you get the exact location um, of, of the site. And you can really see how this, these few megaliths um, have escaped destruction really by a road which was constructed just 15 years ago. And it's, it's very vulnerable. Another site they documented was the Tal Hofra men here. Not, not actually very impressive. Um, it's, um, there's a Bettina Tower marked in red over there, and then there's a road, the Leyel goes to, to Gudia. There's a road by the uh, fields, and the, 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 the stone is found uh, in, in Arab Bilwal. The importance of this site uh, is that Gravino got information from, from, from the farmer that was digging um, the ground um, megaliths where. where Maybe this stone was, was discovered and pottery was also found on site. Not included in Evans, uh, Evans focus makes a description of individual dolmens, but one dolmen, which one structure that escapes um, his mention uh, is this structure, Talolia, which looks like the Talbrolli dolmen, uh, um, it's, uh, this is a photograph taken some, some months ago. Like other dolmens, it, like some other dolmens, it overlooks um, high viewpoint, like uh, Pachench, like Woodfield. You can see the Jebel Chantar uh, cliff marked in red over there. And what is interesting about this site that when you look at the survey sheets, uh, the area or the area meeting to the north is known as Limsakfa, the roofed one. And Limsakfa is a name which is usually associated with dolmens, but also megalithic structures. Um, sometimes you find sites um, which are, um, uh, which there is reference to them simply in the survey sheets. Uh, the problem is, the Juan um, says that this is the megalith at Sharata Bariru, um, but why the survey sheets only mention a megalithic wall. This is an interesting site for many years. I thought that this was, these were the only two uh, pieces of evidence we have uh, of this site. Where we have um, Luigi Maria Golini, uh, a, picture, a photograph reproducing Malta Antica tree uh, here, and another part of the site, or the other part of the site found in the, in, in the albums. Incidentally, that, that uh, person over there is the Reverend Spadaro. So thinking that this is, was on, the only remains uh, present on site, uh, I was very glad to, to, to notice that um, the superintendents of cultural heritage managed to find uh, the site uh, quite recently. And uh, the description given that um, these remains were incorporated into a rubble wall, uh, which currently fall under two uh, different ownerships. So here we have. Uh, 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 the, info uh, uh, the information, a good amount of information about this size, Talhari, which is found um, on the outskirts of Zabar as, as you go down towards Shaira in the Tamaji uh, uh, industrial complex. But if we want more information on this site, we go to Ibivella, the source of Tunjuan. And what does Ibivella say? That Dun GB Spadaro possibly the person we're seeing over there, remembers well a temple in a round form made of large megaliths. This 
had a diameter of 30, of 30 feet. Today, in the Bivella rites, only 10 megaliths remain. Some of them are in the fields of, of the priest uh, and the other one um, and the other one to the south. Uh, Reverend Spadaro preserved the megaliths that were in these fields, but most of the me other megaliths were destroyed by the owner of the other field. So this was, this is giving us an indication earlier still that this was a, a larger, uh, a larger structure. And today, that's the state of the megalith, and the planet megaliths have remained on this side of the picture. Uh, <laughs> he describes Cartas uh, and Paula, and by by using the and Paula, if you know uh, the street plan of Paula, Paula is a grid, grid plan. So this is a, an anomaly that occurs just in a few places, and by using this. Um, the slanting roads um, and this specular uh, blunt, blunt edge is one of the properties I managed to um, locate these car ruts where today there is the parish church of Tatalur. Ta ta um, it's, it's interesting because it locates a pair of, of car ruts and it gives the people on the locality some archaeology to, to relate with and also shows some of the beautiful farmhouses that were present in the area which today um, have, have gone. Some sites occur under um, names which are not used anymore. This is the remains at Tabur Grua, which I managed to, um, by looking about the details, the, the landscape at the back, to equate with the remains of Tassanti, uh, Tassanti Tower, uh, Tassanti Tower um, uh, on the way to Concezioni. Uh, notice as Trump has noted the, the location of the of the remains, which are very close, unfortunately, to this recently uh, built room overlooking uh, uh, an access route uh, to the area. The albums um, are mainly important for minor sites, but even for major sites, they have their, their importance. For example, one of the photographs shows this space to the to, to the south of the southern temple at Imnaidra, uh, shows it quite quite clear clearly. It's it's very very um, not not much remains, but you can see rectangular space uh, in, in both the picture and the di the, the figure given by Evans. On site today, um, really not really much uh, remains. It's not only overgrown but also some of the uh, stones are missing. I'm saying this because when, when the silch was re-excavated in recent years, a similar formation, although I have to agree that it's made of larger stone, was considered part of a temple. So this is, these are structures, these are details, uh, which are shown uh, in, 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 in the output. Here is a picture of the area behind the facade of Hajar Im flooded with water. And I think this picture, Professor Gimo would, would, would really have liked it because it builds into his theory that this was uh, the, the space uh, behind the entrance was deliberately meant to hold water um, to recreate um, the voyage um, of, 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 of arrival uh, into the islands where you could cross the sea, you have um, uh, if I'm interpreting correctly, um, sculpture related to the sea uh, on this side, and then further in the west, you have sculpture related to the land. But to go back to the minor sites, the Hamut Temple, also referred as, as Alet Marku Temple. Um, this is the only um, drawing of, of, or plan of the site I have encountered. So this could be um, unique. Here, there's a picture of a doorway. Here is a picture and a photograph of the remains of Tahamut. Um, it's also a similar view. It's also available in Malta Antica by Golini. And I have put a, a photograph from Shikantiya, from, from Golini's work, uh, to compare, uh, to show that this is equivalent to um, the, 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 the architecture that leads from one place, from one area to another. 
So what are minor sites? This is a big problem, what are minor sites? Um, minor sites, some of them tend to have an architecture similar to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the larger um, temples, temples. So uh, having such photographs helps us to make these conclusions, and I will make my point further. This is a story I would like to go into further, but I don't have all the information. This is uh, Colin Palazzo Marnisi, um, which is claimed to come um, from, from the Silch. This is the column as it existed a few years ago, and I think that um, this column really came from Tassilch uh, because in the collection of Palazzo Marnisi there was this stone. Now, um, this stone um, was uh, studied and published by Professor Anthony Bonanno and Francesca Bonzano, and it is part of the architecture of Tassilch. Uh, um, parts Part, uh, parts like parts of it uh, were found in Tassilj. This gives uh, the idea um, of how originally this frieze looked look, look, look like. I'm saying that this is from Tassilj because Ibivella um, says that um, in Palazzo Marnisi there were two pieces of columns um, found in, in, in Palazzo Marnisi. Um, one of them, I think, it's, it's that column in the middle of, of, of the courtyard. And then he's, he mentions uh, a description of, of this um, white marble, that there is a face-like um, feature with a rod and the rosette. You can read over there, there's a mummy with a, with a, with a, with a sword and a, and a snake on the other side. He clearly refers to, to, to the stone of, of, over there. So, if this stone, which uh, to, to uh, Professor Bonanno's work, um, has come from Tassilj, I don't find it. Um, I, it's plausible that even the columns uh, came from there. It's not just a column in a corner, but it's a column in the middle of a courtyard. Uh, so, it has a strategic place, and this echoes um, the uh, obelisk in Villa Medici um, in. in in Rome, uh, in Rome. So, could it be that they were trying to create or adopting architectural uh, arrangements uh, locally? Incidentally, the inscription mentions the owner uh, of the of the of, of the place of Palazzo Marnisi, um, um, and it also refers to um, giants, um, famosum Herculifanum. There's an interest in this inscription when, when, when the building was built in 1650 in Hercules um, and Giants, and there's a column. So I think this, the, the, the column could have entered uh, at the time. How it could have entered? The owner of the place, um, Giacomo Testaferrata de Robertis, was married to Theodora, whose aunt was Clara, Clara, who was married to Matteo Lodelia. Matteo Lodelia is the known was a slave trader who owned the area of 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 um, Tassilj, uh, between 1623 and until he died in the 1650s. Could this be the way it entered right over there? I don't know, but it's close. There are places which Don Juan um, describes um, and has his ideas on them, but they 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 are. Um, I have found links to Gianfrancesca Bella, which Don Juan didn't have. One place is a source called Columbarium, found at, um, at Fawara, um, where Don Juan thinks that those holes were used, um, were used for cremation burials, but they could easily be a dovecot. After all, it's called the Columbarium. And this place where Roman pottery was fine, found and sizable blocks of stones are depicted and he says this is a Roman site at Tacneus. And I will deal with them one by one. Um, incidentally, the Columbarium was found. Um, the was found in the middle in a cave in the middle of the of, of, of the cliff face. Here you have the Fawara Chapel, and there you have the uh, Wardia on the extreme right is Wardia to San George Bronze Age village. And this place is more known. 
uh, for where the Columbarium is, th that was a, a, a place, a cave church of St. George. And in a write-up by uh, the late uh, Don George, um, Don George Aculina, uh, he makes a write-up of eight pages on the site. He gives a footnote and he says, states that uh, in the property below uh, in the territory known as Ittafli, consisting of eight, eight uh, fields, uh, which are known as Talartuta. And Artuta is referred to in Abela uh, as a place in underground structures with mangers uh, at this side, and close by, uh, if you read Abela, um, clo close by, you find uh, pavement with, with, with tessere, with marble. So from Dunjuan, we finished up um, to, to, um, to John Francisca Bela. As I already mentioned, um, Talkneyes, uh, a Roman site according to Dunjuan, but Talkneyes is also a place mentioned with, with, uh, by John Francisca Bela, uh, who mentions the tradition of a church, a an destroyed ancient church, an underground cemetery, reached by stairs and pillars, uh, and the, the underground structures had pillars holding three arches on top. Um, there was an article uh, on this site. Incidentally, um, Monsignor Vincent Borch um, had visited uh, the place. He makes a claim that um, around Star Providenza, which is Star Neyes, there is this church, and then um, he, he provides his uh, points supporting the thesis that um, this place was um, Santa Maria de Neyes, including the presence of a cross on site. When I was researching on this site, I found an, a FESTA article uh, with this picture, and for me it meant two things, one the cross mentioned by Monsignor Porch, and the other are the two stones um, shown in the picture there by, 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 by Don Juan. Uh, luckily, he gave the the the, um, the the explanation of what how to use the point uh, better than Monsignor Borch. He also said that the cross had since been stolen. Uh, I went on site and I found this and by located uh, the site. Is this Santa Maria Falkneyes? I don't know, um, but at least it's a good point where to start. Okay. Um, Maybe just a few few notes. Um, one of the good points, one of the contributions of 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 um, Don Juan and of the albums is for John Evans. John Evans has a list of sites, a catalog of sites at the end. The albums gives photographs to these sites. This is uh, um, El Araba, um, uh, that, that promontory uh, between Jnaina Bay and Daitofia. This is Tachai, a one in Nevis, pottery, and, 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 uh, and uh, um, the site itself. Um, again, some an art, some photographs from Mugolini, and, and a photograph and a sketch from, from the albums. Notice the header and stretcher arrangement of architecture. Once again, a reference to, 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 to larger sites. He mentions shared and stones in Rabat. Um, unfortunately, the area has been dis um, disturbed recently. Notice the building on both on both uh, photographs. Um, it also explains certain things in Evans. For example, Evans in his description of the windmill cairns uh, mentions three cairns, three small cairns. We know mostly think of two. A possible third one is found uh, in the picture um, um, underneath. And finally, um, I have to stop here. Um, the albums give only one silo, one silo from Wardia to San George, uh, give only a picture of one silo uh, when on site there are 14. Um, it's, it's coincidental, one may think, but when one reads that Evans, at this time, there was open opening of one, only one bell-shaped sh bell excavation scene. So that was what was only available um, at this time. Um, just the last slide uh, on the same side of Wardia to San George. This is 
how the album um, helps us. This is the Wardi at St. George today. That's how it's shown in the album. Once you see that picture, you understand them is a meet when Morta and Gibraltar, he describes Wardi at St. George as a megalithic mound. You can't understand it today, but you can understand it uh, by seeing the picture over there. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much.